told me that he won't use the ah, detector. Ah, you want to save time? Yeah. <laughs>
Someone taking notes today? Okay. So, uh, no one taking notes? Okay, great. Okay, so good afternoon. We continue to discuss uh, an efficient coding of a single variable with a very simple unit with that has a very simple input-output relationship, namely uh, some nonlinear function. So, we started to discuss this uh, last time, but I will remind you. Uh, we imagine that uh, we have an input. Ah, oh, it's uh, continuing the title from last time, but no, I will write it. Wasn't. <laughs> ah, there wasn't? Okay. So the next I see. Okay. So the title is Efficient Coding of a Single Variable. <coughs> okay, so uh, we have an input which I will denote by x. And we have an output, which I will be not denote by r. And I will think for simplicity and also because of the example that we will discuss a bit later, both of x and r as continuous variables. Okay? And um, 
r is some function of x. That's what the unit does. That's the computation that the unit does. It applies some nonlinear function. But this function is um, constrained by the fact that r has to be between 0 and some maximum value. OK? And um, the input x is characterized by some probability distribution, p of x. And now we wish to ask, what is the best way to choose this function f of x in order to encode efficiently the variable x? And we will need to discuss this in, uh, in uh, detail. Um, but for now, uh, we will just write down a hypothesis. I hope this is still OK. Marginal? Yeah. This, this position is the worst, probably, for this hypothesis. Uh, goal, maximize the entropy of R. Okay? Yes. Except for the fact that the stimulus itself comes from the, some distribution. Well, this is a hypothesis on the goal. Okay. Hypothesis on the goal. Uh, and um, when I say entropy, I really mean differential entropy. So because we're dealing with a continuous variable. So that's what I really mean. And I'm, I'm stating for purpose the goal in this way because this was a starting point of a, a very influential and impo interesting paper that we will discuss. We'll discuss this more in more detail later. So um, that's what we need to do. In the fun now, so the now the question is well defined. How do we choose the function f of x such that, of course, it has to obey this constraint that is always between 0 and r max? Let's imagine that x itself is b uh, between minus infinity to infinity. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll write it down. So x is between minus infinity to infinity. And, um, and the go question is, how do we choose a function f of x such that we maximize the, the differential entropy of, uh, of, of, uh, um, of r? Now, the differential entropy of r is written in terms of the probability distribution of r. So I just want to, um, for a, a few minutes, put this aside and discuss something that mm, all of you know, but just it's important to remind ourselves that how, when we, this is how do we um, go from a distribution of one variable to another variable, which is a function of the first variable. OK, so we have p of x, and we want to write something like p of r, and we want to ask how to go from one to the other. And um, the important thing to remember is that it's not just substituting here the relationship between r and x. Okay? That's not what we want to do. So what we really want to, to do, if we want to be um, in our notation to be precise, is to remember that these are two different functions. There's some function of px of x and some other function that I will denote by pr of r. That's a more proper notation. And each one of them is the probability density function one of this variable and the other of this variable. And it tells us what is the probability, say, to fall between x and x plus dx would be px of x times dx. And the probability to fall between, between r and r plus dr will be pr of r. So how do we relate one to another? It's very easy. What we need to remember is that if we have some um, relationship between x and r, and we have some interval, oops, this is a bad choice of how to draw it. We have some interval of x, and we have a certain probability to fall in that interval. That's the same as the probability to fall in, the inter in this interval if we think of r. So what is the relationship between the x and the r? Well, we know, first of all, that p, so, so let me first write down what I said in, wor in words. 
Px of x times dx has to be equal to Pr of r times dr. But the relationship between dx and dr is set by this function. And if these are infinitesimal intervals, it's just set by the slope of this function, which is a derivative, right? So dr to dx in this situation is just f prime of x, right? Where, okay, so this is where r is f of x, right? This is the, this is the setup. And therefore, we'll see now how to relate these two functions. You see that a pr of r is equal to 1 over f prime of x times px of x. Um, okay, so now often we don't put these indices here. We don't put explicitly, just as I did here, I was a little bit sloppy, but we often do it. We don't write pr of r, p of x, but we have to remember what we mean by this. This is not the same as just substituting the relationship between r of x, in which case we would not have this 1 over f prime of x. Okay, fine. So, so this was just a reminder again of something that you know. And now we will use this uh, in order to understand what is the pro best choice of f of x. Okay. Well, because dr to the x is a f prime of x, so we need to... I, okay, I could write, take one more step and write that px of x is pr of r times dr to the x. Right, and then if I want pr of r, I need to divide by dr to the x, which is what I did here. There's another way to check it, and this is to look at units. So if we imagine that x and r have some units, then what is the unit of pr of r? It's one over the units of r, because, because pr probability, this is a probability which is dimensionless. So this times this has to be dimensionless, which means that the, pr the dimensions of this is one over the dimensions of dr. This has one over the dimensions of dx. f prime of x has the dimensions of r over x, and so you can see that this all, all of this gets, uh, is, is, is okay. It would not be okay if you would put f prime of x in the, in the numerator. So this is another way to check yourself if you're not sure. Anyway, um, so now we ask what is the optimal, under this goal, hypothetical, you know what, you ask me whether it's hypothesis or goal, who asked me? Yeah. Okay, so let's write it a bit different, hypothetical goal, and it's better. So this is our hypothetical goal and we want to um, uh, achieve it, so we want to ask what is the optimal f of x under the constraint and um, well actually I've gone through all this um, we will use it in a moment in principle we could write now p r of r in terms of p x of x which is given this is known p x of x is known and in terms of f of x using this equation and, and maximize the entropy under the constraint. I will not do it in that way. Neta is supposed to do it with you. Maybe she did it on already or she will do it this week. Did you do it with Neta already? <laughs> did you discuss this problem with Neta in any way? Okay, good. Okay, so we'll do it with Neta in, in, th in that other way. But I claim that actually we don't need to work hard. We almost know the answer. Can someone tell me what is the best choice uh, to maximize the entropy, the optimal, what is the way to get the, the best entropy uh, of R? What do we know if this is what we're doing? We want to maximize the entropy of R under this constraint. What does that mean? Okay, what? What did you say? Yeah, yeah, we discussed it last, uh, last week that uh, if a function which has, is, is just, constrained to, be, to take values between some, in an interval, uh, the form of that function that maximizes differential entropy is uniform. So we actually know 
that PR of R must be some constant. And we know also what is the constant. The constant is 1 over R max because it has to be normalized. And now we can use this to find what is Px of x. I'll, go, I'll, I'll describe in a moment what I meant when I said that there's another way to do it. I'll do it, do it later. So r right now what we know is that 1 over R max is P of x. I'm not writing now anymore these indices. P of x divided by F prime of x. And therefore, P of x, so therefore F prime of x is equal to um, R max P of x. And now we, all, we need to just integrate this to find f of x. So f of x is equal to r max, an integral of p of x dx. Let's try to be a bit more precise. This is an integration variable, so I will give it another name, p of x prime dx prime. The integral is up to x. And where do I start? Yes. How do I know that I should start it with minus infinity? How do I know that I should start in minus infinity and not in some other value? What is the range? What it's under this? Because I need r, which is f of x, to take values between 0 and the r max. So if I put here the lower bound as minus infinity, when x goes to minus infinity, f will go to 0. And when x goes to infinity, this is 1, and then we get r max. OK, if I would choose another constant here, we would get something that varies in a smaller interval. That's not what we want. OK. Yeah, if I put here minus infinity, we can check what happens when I substitute. So I could have written it as a sum, uh, in a different way. We choose something here and put some constant, right? But let's do it this way. So we can check what happens when I substitute here x going to minus infinity and x going to infinity. Okay, so when x goes to minus infinity, this becomes 0 if I choose just like this. If I would choose, it, actually it's worse even, if I would choose here something which is not minus infinity, we could get here numbers which are negative. We did not, we did not allow this, right? If, if, x, if x would be, if this is some constant, say 0, and I put here an x which is smaller than 0, I'd get something uh, negative here. So. Because this integral approaches 0 when the upper limit goes to 1 minus infinity, right? So this integral approaches 0 when x prime approaches zero, uh, minus infinity. And it approaches infinity as uh, 1 when x prime approaches infinity. When x, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Yes, x. Um, OK, so. Um, Okay, so this is what we got, all right? So in other words, what is f of x? How do we call this by name? Yeah, f of x is a cumulative distribution. It's proportional to the f of x is proportional to the cumulative, cumulative, cumulative distribution function of x. Now, if we just look at this, at this relationship, it actually tells us something that makes sense. What it tells us is that at those values of x that are more likely, the output function is more sensitive to x, right? 
and in areas where um, x is very unlikely, we can afford to make the output function unsensitive to x because these values of x are, are rare. So this connects to, I discussed this already as an intuition when last week when, when we discussed this. If we have a P of X, let's say, looks like this. Then F of X will be sensitive, most sensitive to X in, in these regions. And it will be very unsensitive to X in these regions. And this is what we get by this choice. So F of X in this case Between, between R max and zero, and this is uh, um, this is uh, uh, x. So f of x will be um, um, something which almost doesn't vary, and then it will have maximal maximal uh, slope here, and I put the R max in the wrong place. And this is F of X. Okay. So now um, there are a few things. That the, there's something that we still need to do, and, and this is to discuss why this hypothetical goal makes sense. Okay. But we will wait for with this for a moment and I before that I want to tell you about a work uh, that actually used this argument to to look at uh, the response of uh, uh, neurons in the fly retina so uh, Ah, before that, uh, something else. So I, I just mentioned to you that we could have done all this differently. So here we, we just looked at P. We, we said we know what this should be. This should be uniform, and therefore we can find uh, uh, F. This we know, and therefore we can find F. There's another way to, to, um, to, uh, to do it. Um, and uh, you will do it with Neta. And this is to, to um, think of the values of F as some uh, variables. This is like functional, uh, functional uh, uh, derivative that we discussed last time. We, we think about the values of X, F of X for every value of X as a variable and take a derivative. We write down the, the, the we can write down the uh, differential entropy of R which is this, but write it in this way, and then ask what is, the, what is the form of F that maximizes it under the constraints while taking a functional derivative. More complicated way to do it, it yields the same result, but it's, it's, it's instructive um, to, to see how it works because it just will teach you more about how to take functional derivatives and, and deal with optimization problems of this form. Okay, so. So now we discuss a paper by Simon Laughlin, another uh, neurobiologist from the UK. There, is a long, there was a long tradition of applying uh, uh, the efficient hypothesis, uh, efficient coding hypothesis to neural systems in the UK. Um, and the paper is from 1981, and uh, if it's not on the model yet, I will put it on the model. So uh, he, he discussed, uh, he, he was thinking about neurons that have this property, that they have a graded uh, continuous input and continuous output. They do not spike, they do not receive spikes. These are second order neurons in the fly, um, uh, uh, in the fly eye. So it's, um, it's similar to bipolar cells in our eyes. They, re they receive input from photoreceptors, and the input is a potential, it's, a, it's a continuous, and they also output a continuous uh, potential to the next order neurons. Um, so um, 
So first I will tell you about an experiment. Um, the experiment was an experiment to measure the input-output relationship of these neurons, but there are some subtleties that we need to discuss. So um, one subtlety is that uh, in the visual system, in many levels, but also at the, the level of photoreceptors, at the level of um, bipolar cells, or here it's these second-order cells that I, I don't remember their exact name because it's a fly eye, ah, it's not a mammalian uh, retina. Um, there, is there are various forms of adaptation. So the first thing that, uh, that is done, you need, if you want to do a controlled experiment, you need to understand at what level of light intensity you're, you're working, what, which level of light intensity you're adapting the, the eye to. So first of all, one adapts the, the eye to, to a certain uh, constant illumination. So um, so maybe I, f I will write uh, um, something about the cells, second order cells. I don't, I f unfortunately, I don't have the names of these cells in my notes. Uh, but if you look at the paper, you can, you can see what it is. Um, and um, so one other thing that I mentioned is that it's a graded input, graded output. And then in the experiment, one adapts um, the retina to constant illumination. Let's call that uh, I bar. This will be the constant light intensity that the retina constantly receives. And then what, what, what was done in the experiment is that transiently some perturbation was made on the, on the illumination and the output of a single one of these cells was measured. So the assumption here is that the input is really proportional to the intensity, which is not really obvious. One has to check the photoreceptors as well. But the assumption is that the input is proportional to the intensity and the output is what is being measured. Yeah, so the input to the cell is really the input that it's receiving from photoreceptors. So each one of these cells receives input from several photoreceptors. All these photoreceptors are seeing the same illumination because it's just uniform. And the assumption, again, is that the output of the photoreceptors is simply linear in the, in the illumination. Uh, and what is being measured, I'll continue here, is the response to a transient change in, uh, in, in illumination. All uniform, spatially uniform, but just temporally transient. So let me r just draw uh, what happens when you do that. So imagine that you have some, uh, this constant illumination, this is I bar, and at some point in time, you either increase a little bit the illumination, so I will draw this with red, or decrease the illumination a little bit. So let's let's call this I bar plus delta I. You know what I will use. No, okay, that's okay. I bar plus delta I. And we can imagine either increasing or decreasing, and we can imagine varying the magnitude of delta i. So here delta i is smaller than zero, and here delta i is larger than zero. So this is just the, what is being done. This is the input to the retina that is being delta i. Delta i. Okay. And now when, while doing this, one measures the voltage on these cells the voltage that these cells output, the membrane potential. A and what one sees is that there is some constant uh, output of the cell, uh, and constant membrane potential. And then when you, when you introduce this uh, 
this uh, modification, there is some transient um, response. Okay. And in this case, the membrane potential goes down in a very similar way. Okay. So. So now, by just by by, de by decision, by definition. Uh, Simon Laughlin decided to call this, the amplitude of this, the response. So over a wide range, range of choices of delta i, the temporal structure remains more or less the same, and what varies as you change delta i is the amplitude, the maximum here, and this is what he measured. Okay? So you see that there are some subtleties having to do with the fact that there is a temporal aspect to the response of the retina, and we're this is not really within the scope of our, our very simple theory that we discussed here. In this theory, we imagine there's an input, single variable, there's an output. We did not incorporate into the theory any aspect of time dependence, and we force on the theory these aspects by just deciding that this is how we perform the experiment. Okay? Anyway, um, so you see, I mean, neurons really respond. Neurons really respond to is changes in the the illumination. They do not respond to a constant illumination. But what Simon Laughlin decided to do is just to plot the relationship between delta i and the response. And here's what he got. So um, I will use the following, uh, the following axis. On this axis, I will not simply plot delta i. I will plot delta i divided by i bar. Okay, so this is one thing that I will do. And the other thing is that when I draw the responses, I will normalize them by the maximal response that were, was observed in this experiment. So what Simon Laughlin observed, he actually did the experiment. Yeah, so what he observed is that if you put, if you create a delta i which is sufficiently large, the response saturates. Okay? So that defines the maximal response that you can get. And the response is um, normalized by this. And therefore, um, and it can be negative and it can be positive. So it, it goes really between and the maximal positive response was about the same as the maximal negative response. So let's just imagine that it's exactly the same. So then when we normalize in this way, this variable goes between minus 1 and 1. OK? So this is a bit different from our formulation that we did in the beginning of the lecture, where the v output was between 0 and 1. So now it's between minus and 1 and 1. But it's very easy to see how to to uh, modify the theory for that case. OK, so um, so you know what? Um, I will just put the axis here, because it will be more convenient. Sorry. Uh, so I'll put the axis here. And this will be uh, delta i over i bar. And now. Um, I will draw first a continuous line. I will tell you later what it is. Now it's clear that delta i, in principle, you could imagine uh, that uh, it, it could be uh, positive any value, but negative it's limited by, 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 uh, by I, I bar. We cannot make delta i smaller than uh, we cannot make the intensity negative. So delta i um, well, okay, there's there's some actually there's some there's, there's some distribution of delta i's. Okay. So so no, I, I was I what I said was confused, so I will just not repeat it. There is some distribution of delta i's in the experiment. Some range of delta i's. So um let me draw a uh, some some line here. 
and now we'll draw the, the actually the experimental uh, measurements. So of course measurements have uh, some error bars on them, but they fall quite close to, to the line that I'm drawing. I'll explain what the line is in a moment. You have to look at the paper to see how it looks exactly. But the, the measurements fall on a, on a line that looks like this, so it saturates both for small uh, delta i and for positive delta i. And now the question is, what is this, uh, what is this red line? So what Simon Laughlin did independently of, uh, of doing these measurements from the retina, he did something completely independent, which was to take a camera, which is supposed to be kind of similar in its properties to, in some sense, to the fly, pr to the optical properties of the fly uh, retina, and just walked with it, um, I don't know, in the woods or something like that. He looked at the statistics of what he thought was a good approximation of natural images. And so he looked at, he, he got some images, he had this, a, 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 an average intensity, he looked at the deviations from the a average intensity and their probability, and he just plotted the, the cumulative distribution function of that, of that quantity, and that's the red line. Okay. So the red line is coming just from the statistical of natural, quote, natural images, natural as much as he could get them to be um, under the way that he measured them. So this is again the cumulative distribution function. Uh, it's the cumulative distribution function of natural images. And you see that the, the results um, fit very, very nicely. I mean, you can look at the paper. They fit very, very nicely with this theory that we discussed. So, so he begins his paper by saying, by, by, uh, by putting forth this um, hypothetical goal, that the goal of, this, of these neurons is to encode the input that they receive from the, the uh, photoreceptor un under some constraint on the in minimal input and the uh, minimal output and the maximal output, and while maximizing the entropy. Okay. So now this is very nice, but uh, and and if you think about it carefully, uh, you realize that there is really no fitting parameters in this uh, in this procedure. You can look at the paper also. There is nothing to fit. Yes. Uh, no. So it's it's. It's a cumulative distribution function up to the rescaling that you need to do to get it to like uh, as when we did the previously we had to mu multiply it by R max, right? To and so here you you have to set it so that it will be between minus one and one. But but that's up to some scaling and uh, shifting to get the correct range of input and output. But we know he knows from the measurements from the from these cells what is the minimal output, what is the maximal output. So that's not something that you you can fit it, you know it. In that sense, this, this procedure really doesn't have any fitting parameters, and it provides a very nice agreement. Now I want to argue that it's, there's something very odd about this whole idea, and it, it, it doesn't make much sense. What do you mean there are no fitting Well, that, um, so, um, indeed, uh, when I plotted this line, it's not really the cumulative distribution function, it's the cumulative distribution function multiplied by some number and with some, something added. But it's all added to just to fit the range to go between minus one and one. So, so there's, there's in that sense, there's no fitting parameters. It just, this is, there's nothing that, there's no, there's no extra parameter that you can vary uh, to, to make this fit well with the data. Um, so I just, w I just want to point out what is the difficulty that, that the whole idea, uh, if you think about it more carefully, maybe doesn't make so much sense, then, and then we'll take a break. So um, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, we need to ask ourselves why is this hypothetical goal meaningful? 
Why is our goal to maximize the, uh, the mutual entropy? So you can say, uh, sorry, the not mutual entropy, the, mutual, the, the differential entropy. So you can say the goal is to, to maximize the differential entropy because differential entropy is a measure of information. We want to maximize the information that the output unit is conveying about the input. But does this really make sense in the way that we thought about it, in the, in the way that we uh, discussed so far? So imagine that you have some variable uh, x and this variable might have some uh, uh, probability distribution and you transfer it into some other represent to through a nonlinear function to f of x right um, and f of x could look like this, and f of x could uh, get another color, could maybe look like this, so of course, um, for example, in this choice there is a wide range of values of x for which the output is quite unsensitive to x. But as long as this is a monotonic function with a derivative that goes to zero here, but it's not zero, as long as this is a monotonic function, in either case, there is a one-to-one -one relationship between x and f of x. So if I tell you what is f of x, so far in the way that we discussed the problem up to now, if I tell you what is f of x, you know what is x. There's no loss of information. Whatever way you choose a function f of x. So why should it matter whether we choose this, this function which is, you know, is very sensitive to x right only in this region or the black function which is sensitive to x over this larger region? It doesn't matter. In, all, in both cases, I tell you what is f of x, you can read out from it x. Even in this region where this, it's very unsensitive, you can, I tell you what is f of x, you can tell me what is x. Yes? Okay, very good. So this is what I was going to ask you um, to think about, and we have the answer. So um, we can imagine a reason why it would matter. The reason might be noise. Now, is this noise on X or noise on R which matters in this case? F on R, right? So if I tell you R, which is set by f of x, but instead of telling you what is r, I tell you some corrupted version of r, corrupted by noise, then of course in these regions you will do very badly. And then it might make sense, once we have noise on the output of the unit, it might make sense that we want to tune the range of in which r is sensitive to x to be set by the range in which x actually takes, has a reasonable probability to take values. Okay? So this is the reasoning. that. Once we have noise in, this, in the system, the whole formulation might make sense, but now we want to, therefore, to understand how to formulate this mathematically. So this is what we'll do after the break.
יושב על הקו, ובלי שאני צריך לבחור איזה פרמטר שלא מדדתי אותו, כדי לבדוק אם הוא מעלה. נכון, אבל אז זהו, כיוון שאין פרמטר חופשי, פונקציה שמתחילה... אני מסכים, זה איזשהו... אבל עדיין... בגלל שאין פרמטר חופשי. בגלל שאין פרמטר חופשי, אז בכל זאת...
Okay, so um, so I will try to write down uh, what I was saying in words. Uh, so far, in the way that we so far in the way that we formulated the model, 
any monotonic relationship between X and R preserves all information about X. So I tell you R, you can know what, what, what is X, so it's really the way we discussed it so far, it doesn't make sense that it take matters what, what function we choose as long as it's one-to-one uh, -one between X and R. So to make things more uh, meaningful, uh, we will follow the proposal to uh, introduce noise. Okay, well. So a more sensible model is uh, that we want to, uh, that we will, our observation will be corrupted by noise. Let's denote the noise by psi. And now it makes sense that um, that when, when there's noise, um, if f of x is insensitive to x, in those regions where f of x is insensitive to x, due to the noise, we'll not be able to reconstruct x well, whereas in regions where it is sensitive, we will be able to reconstruct x well. But we need to more formalize now, what is our question? So we don't care about maximizing the information um, um, in R because information in R now includes information about X, but it also includes, R depends both on X and on Xi. We want some way to measure, to quantify, how much information R conveys about X. That's what we want to maximize. So first we need to formalize this. And most of you, since you're going through Tali's course, know what is the answer, what we should maximize. Can someone tell me? What? Mutual information. You said it to me, I think, uh, already last week. So what we really want to maximize now is the mutual information between R and X, but for those of you who are not taking studies course, we need to, for to explain what I mean by this. But So let me just write first, just in words, um, a goal. Maximize information conveyed <coughs> by R about X. And we need to, to formalize this concept. So this is what we will do in the, mostly in the rest of, the, of, the, to the, of, the, of this lecture. But before I, I delve into the definition of mutual information, which will be the quantification of this, um, I want to point out one other thing. We did something. In, I mean, Simon, Simon Laughlin did something, and he generated a, a meaningful uh, result. Now what he did is to maximize the differential entropy, to differ maximize the differential entropy of R. And I would like to remind you that um, the differential entropy itself is a quantity that one needs to think about a bit carefully in order to remember what it means. What it means, uh, I remind you, is that if we, um, uh, if we, um, a discretize say, the variable R with some discretization delta R, then the entropy of telling you in which bin we fall is given by the differential entropy plus log of one over delta R. So this provides a hint already for what are the situations in which this formulation will map into what Simon Laughlin has assumed. So now imagine that, again, you, you, we go through, we transfer x to r through this nonlinear function, and then this function is, this is, is corrupted 
by noise. What do you think are the assumptions about the noise under which maximizing the differential entropy will map into what I'm going to do next, uh, to into this uh, information conveyed by, by R about X with noise? Is there some hidden assumption about the noise? So, so okay. So, what is what is if cons in a very qualitative manner? What will be the relationship between pr the properties of the noise and the bin size in this picture? So, imagine that you get this number plus some plus some noise that has some standard deviation. What should we think about when we map this way of thinking to this thing way of thinking? What is what should be the bin size that we think about? The standard deviation of the noise, because once you're corrupted by noise with some standard deviation, really know where you are up to the to the scale of the standard deviation of the noise. So the, I claim that there's a hidden assumption if what if we maximize the the differential entropy about the noise. Anyone can. Tell me. It, well, not necessarily Gaussian, but something about its standard deviation. But it doesn't depend on the X. Perfect. So it doesn't. Another way to think about it is it doesn't depend on R. Okay. So with if I assume that the, if the noise is just additive and has a, a variance which does not depend on the output, it's like having a uniform binning of the output. And as we discussed, the differential entropy tells us something about the, inf the, 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 the information about uniform binning. And if the noise has a, a bin size which depends on the output, maybe when the output, when the unit is close to saturation, it has more or less noise than when it's close to, to here, then we might find out that the, um, the form of the nonlinearity that was found by, mu by maximizing the uh, uh, differential entropy will not conform to, to what will be best under this more general formulation. So this, all this we will discuss a bit later. For now, what I want to do is just to formalize this concept of you have two variables and I want to formalize the information conveyed by one variable about the other. So we will pu we're putting all this aside and going back to uh, information theory. Um, and discussing mutual information. So, so imagine that we have two random variables x and y and I will write down the definition and we'll discuss why it makes sense what it means so the mutual information between x and y is defined um, I will write it in bits now so I will use age age of y minus H of Y given X averaged on X. So this is the definition. Bef first of all, the first thing that I need to do is just to clarify uh, what I mean by this. So this is the entropy of Y. There is some distribution of Y and that defines the entropy of Y. There is also for any value of X, there is a conditional probability distribution of Y given X. And we can associate that with that also an entropy. And then what we do here, we know, but it still depends on the value of x. So for each value of x, we evaluate the entropy of y given x, and then we average over x. That's the definition. Now we, I want to explain why this quantity is interesting. So the interpretation of this is the number of bits required 
to encode Y without knowledge of X. What this tells us is what is the average number of bits required to encode Y if you do know X, right? For any particular X, this is quantified by the entropy, as we know, but X itself is a random variable, so if the average number of bits that will re be required to encode Y conditional X is will be the average of this entropy over the distribution of X. So in any case, this is the number of bits required to encode Y Yeah, of course it's the mean, so maybe we should have average and average here as well. To encode Y when X is known. So So you can think about it even, I will write it in, a, in an even more, uh, in, a, in an even more um, short version. This is the information in Y, the amount of information in Y. And this is the additional information that I need to provide to you if you already know X in order to know what Y is. So you can think about it as the info in Y not present in X. Right? This is the additional information that I would need to give you once you know X in order to know Y. And so therefore the difference between these quantities, you can think about it as the information in Y which is already present in X. Okay. And that's the definition of the mutual information. <coughs> now, um, One thing that you can note is that um, the definition that I wrote here is not symmetric in X and Y. I think I decided to write here Y and here to y, write Y given X, but conceptually the, co the shared information between X and Y sounds like a quantity which needs to be symmetric in X and Y, right? So we need to check, we need to check whether this quantity is symmetric in X and Y. Um, so I will write, start to write down some properties. Um, so one thing that you can uh, easily check, I will leave it as an exercise for you. It's short. It's a very simple exercise. Is that the uh, mutual information? Um, in X and Y uh, can be written as the um, as age of Y plus age of X minus age of X and Y. So This is the entropy of Y plus the entropy of X minus the, share, the entropy in these two variables combined. Once you see this, once you see that this is true, once you show that this leads to this, you realize, you can realize that this expression is completely symmetric in X and Y. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, age I of X and Y can be written just as much as um, age of X minus age of X given Y uh, averaged over the distribution of Y. 
Now, uh, I would also like to write explicitly uh, this in terms of the probabili probability distribution, uh, the joint probability distribution of X and Y. So, imagine that um, Um, I need to, I need more space for this, so I'll continue here. Uh, so imagine that uh, uh, X takes some uh, values, um, uh, some discrete values, and Y takes some discrete values. Um, This is also not great. Ah. Ah, that's better. So imagine that X takes some discrete values where I goes from 1 to N and Y, YJ, where J goes from 1 to M. So I claim that uh, this expression can be written as follows. I x, y is equal to the average of log p of x, y divided by p of x, p of y over the probability distribution of x and y, and I, I will write it as a sum over these values. So what this means is the sum over i going from 1 to n, sum over j going from 1 to m, P of x i y j uh, log p of x i y j divided by p of x i p of y j, and then um, you can see why why this is uh, correct because the log can be opened up to the sum of this minus this minus this. So the first term, p of x i y j times log of p of x y minus i j, summing over all i j is just the definition of minus, is minus the entropy of x y. So this is uh, this term. And say the terms, the term that involves p of x i, uh, once we sum over j here, so we have here p of x i y j, p of log p of x i, summing over y j just generates the marginal of this distribution over x i, so we end up with p of x i, p log p of x i, minus sum p of x i, log of p of x i, and that will be uh, this term. And then there's another term which will be h of y. So if you're not sure why this is correct, your job is to check it carefully that you agree with me that this is correct but this is a way to write this. Um, and um, I would like to briefly go through a few properties of the mutual information. So one we discussed is the fact that it's symmetric. There's another important property, which is the mutual information between two variables is always larger than zero. When is, when is it zero? Right, when they are independent. So we can see here from the other way, uh, when to s you can see that when they are independent, it's zero uh, in two ways. One, using this expression, remember that for two independent variables, the entropy 
their joint entropy is just the sum of the entropy, so we'll get here zero. And you can also see this here. If uh, y is independent of x, then age of y given x is just age of y, regardless of the value of x. So when we average over x, we still get age of y, so we have age of y minus age of y. So, um, um, i of x, y equals zero if and only if uh, x and y are independent. We just discussed uh, right now this direction of the arrow, that if they are independent, uh, the mutual entropy is zero, but it's also possible to prove that if it's zero, they have to be independent. And um, finally, um, I will extend this inequality. So I already told you that the mutual intro, uh, information is um, uh, larger than zero, but it's also, we can bound it from above. Any idea what we can bound it above by? Well, maybe probably you know this, most of you. The entropy of x and the entropy of y. The shared information between x and y cannot be larger than the information in each one of them separately. So it's smaller than age of x and age of y. And so um, we'll probably leave these pro proof of these properties to some exercises. Um, Now, I want to make one comment about, uh, one more comment is that um, that it can also be defined also for continuous variables. Um, how by just replacing the entropies, the Shannon entropies here, by the differential entropies. Okay, so this replacing each one of these by a differential entropy. But there's an interesting comment to make about uh, uh, the mutual information for continuous variables, which relates to a comment that I made about the differential entropy. So for the differ differential entropy, remember that I, I emphasized to you that its interpretation depends on the choice of discretization that you make. So if you discretize, there is some implicit assumption in, in using the differential entropy on its own, which is that you discretize the variable using uniform intervals. Then it relates directly to the Shannon entropy of the discretized variable. But if you do a different discretization, you would get something else. Turns out that for mutual information, um, if you decide on some form of discretization, some, some you know, where to put to make the discretization, which is not uniform. So you decide on some form of discretization and decide on some um, um, where you will put more, dis more, uh, more refined small bins and where you will put some larger bins. Um, and you do this for X, you do this for Y. Um, as long as the bins are become small in the limits of the bins become small, you end up with a result for the mutual information which does not depend on the choice of discretization. So in that sense, the, the um, mutual information in the continuum limit, in the, in the limit of continuous variables, is a more meaningful variable than the differential entropy. It tells you really, it really measures something fundamental about the relationship between the variable X and Y, how much more information you need to I would need to provide you in order to tell you what is y given x, which is independent of a, of a scheme of discretization that you choose. This is just a comment. You, if, you will, if you want, you can try to prove it uh, by thinking about you know, the discrete limit. But I will not prove it right now. Okay, so I, I just want to do some very simple example. Um, what should I write now? What did I write last? Here, right? Um, this is only when the bins are very small. 
Yes, yes, yes. So, so in general, so the, in general, the relationship between um, the differential entropy or, or here differential mutual information and Shannon information has to do with this notion of, of, uh, of bins. And the relationship, if you look at what we did when we discussed differential entropy, is correct when the bins are sufficiently small that the probability in each bin is more or less constant. Right? That was the, the, the criterion. But we could imagine doing this using very small bins, which are still not uniformly, not uniform in size. And is it very small? So for the differential entropy, even if they're very small, you'll get, you would, if you would ask, so if you take a variable which has some distribution, and you discretize with very small bins, but maybe you make them more dense here and less dense here, and then more dense here. And you ask what is the Shannon entropy of the where you, in which bin you fall, you will not be able to describe it using the simple differential entropy that we wrote. The differential entropy works only if the bins are uniform in size. The differential entropy will tell you what is the entropy of the discretized variable only if the, if the, if the bins are uniform in size. On the other hand, if you do some non-uniform discretization of X and then some non-uniform discretization of Y, two, two variables, and you ask what is the mutual information between the discretized versions of these variables, this will not depend, once the, once the bins are sufficiently small, it will just give you the mutual information, the, the, this, con this, this uh, definition of the mutual information where you plug in here the differential entropies. So remember the, the differential entropy. The no, you can you again you can you can imagine making you know all very small bins, but still making them more dense here than here. You could do it, right? I th well, I think I'm not understand your question. So it's, well, for the differential, no, but, but for the differential entropy, it wor doesn't work out that way. And you also know that the, for the differential entropy, so the, the entropy associated just with the bin in which you fall diverges when, this, when the bin size goes to zero. It became, behave, there's this term of log one over <coughs> delta x. And it matters how you, how you arrange your bins. That part, the matter, for that part, it matters how you arrange your bins. If we discussed the case where they're uniform, but if they would not be uniform, it would diverge, still diverge, but in a different way. So, okay, it's a little bit of a, you need to, think, to, to look at it more carefully to, to be convinced, but I'm just pointing this out that I'll try to say it again, that for the interpretation of differential entropy, the discretization matters. For the interpretation of, let's call it, differential mutual information, the, the form of the discretization do no longer matters. You could discretize more finely in some regions and less finely in others. No matter how you do it, as long as the bins are small, there's a certain amount of information, added information in bits that I would need to provide if you know X in order for you to know Y. And that goes to some finite limit which does not depend on the, on the way in which you discretize. Yes? So there could be any specific relationship? No, no, no. Maybe we can uh, write a, 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 an optional exercise on this. Just if you want to, to, if you want to understand better, you need to think about it and do the cal do the calculation and see. Okay, I want to do a very simple example of mutual information, and then we will uh, continue to back go back to Simon Laughlin's work. Um, Ah, I should have continued there. Never mind. Um, so let's imagine that we have some variable y, which is some other variable x, which I will call the signal, and uh, and it's corrupted by some other variable which I will call the noise. And for simplicity, I will assume that X and Xi are Gaussian variables. Um, 
uh, with zero mean and uh, and they're independent. So I write it here: independent Gaussian variables with zero mean and with variances which are uh, sigma x squared and the variance of xi is sigma xi squared. So, what is the mutual information between x and y? It's the, I will write it now in nits. So, so it's s of y minus the average of s of y given x averaged over x. Okay, um, what can we say about y? What kind of uh, variable is it? Sum of two Gaussians. It's also a Gaussian. So it's also a Gaussian. Um, what is the variance of y? It's just the sum of these variances, right? So we know what is the entropy of a, of a Gaussian. We, we did it last last week. So this part, S of Y, is half ln of 2 pi E uh, sigma X square plus sigma Xi square. What about this term? What can we say about Y conditioned on X? Y conditioned on X, what kind of variable is it? It's also a Gaussian. What is the variance? Sigma Xi square, and it has a mean. It has a mean which is given by X. But remember that the entropy of a Gaussian does not depend on its mean. It only depends on its variance. So the mean doesn't matter. And therefore, this quantity will be the same regardless of what is X always going to be the entropy of a Gaussian with variance sigma xi squared. And therefore, when we take the mean, we will just get the same value each time, which I can write immediately. So that's half ln 2 pi e sigma xi squared. And um, now I need to write to continue in another place. Okay, so I of XY is equal to half ln of sigma X square plus sigma Y square, sigma Xi square, divided by sigma Xi square. Right, the 2 pi E can cancels out. Um, we can also write this as half. Now, note that in, in, in this uh, formulation, in this problem, there's nothing different fundamentally between X and Xi. Both are random Gaussian variables, but I want to think about X as a, as a, as a signal and Xi as a corrupting noise, so I will single out X as special by writing this as half line by, by um, sorry, this, ah, no, 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 uh, sorry. Uh, we, we singled out X already by taking the mutual information specifically between X and Y. We didn't take the mutual information between Xi and Y. Okay, so this is already, you see here that this is not symmetric with respect to X and Xi, this is because we calculated the mutual information with respect to X. And this can be written also as half ln 1 plus sigma, sigma x squared divided by sigma y squared. And it's just, a, um, or so I could put also the square like this. So it's just um, interesting to see how this behaves. Um, and this would be sigma xi. Um, so it, uh, it's nice to see how this function depends on this quantity. What is this quantity? It's the variance of the signal divided by the variance to of the noise. So this is sometimes what is called the signal-to-noise ratio. So 
So you can see that the mutual information between X and Y behaves, we can see how it behaves when the signal to noise ratio is large and how it behaves when the signal to noise ratio is small. So when the signal no no to noise ratio is large, what we get is a half, well, then this is much larger than one, so I can ignore the one. The ln of the square of something is just uh, two times the ln. So we get ln of sigma x divided by sigma xi. And this has a very intuitive interpretation. If we think about the standard, this, the standard deviation of the noise as setting an effective bin size, we have a variable which ranges over the range sigma x and we kind of divide it into bins of psi sigma psi and so this is like the number of bins, right? And you know that we have a finite number of bins, the, the entropy is just log of the number of bins. So effect, this relates to what I told you uh, earlier that we can think about the effect of the noise as qualitatively similar to binning the, va the variable x into bins of psi sigma psi. So this is the behavior when the signal to noise ratio is large. So this is when sigma x over sigma y goes to infinity. And the behavior when sigma x uh, going to between sigma, sigma y goes to zero, well, um, when the noise is very large compared to the range of x, we expect that the amount of information that we will get about uh, about x by observing y will be very small, and that's in indeed what, what happens. When sigma x divided by sigma y is, is, is zero, in that strict limit, we just get ln of one, which is zero. But uh, as long as sigma x divided by sigma is one is not precisely zero, we have some information, and that information is given by, uh, well, when something is small, log of one plus x is, a, is approximately x, so we have here half um, sigma x over sigma y squared. So you see here not only that when the signal to noise goes to zero, the information conveyed by y about x is goes to zero, you also see how it goes to zero. It goes quadratically with the ratio of the standard deviations. Um, So I will just take a couple of minutes to write down what we need to do now. So th this is all I wanted to tell you about uh, mutual information. Um, again, we will give some exercises uh, uh, in order for you to, to um, get a better sense of this quantity, uh, but many of you are also familiar with this quantity from, uh, from Tally's course. Uh, but what I want to so what I want to do now is to recast the problem that Simon Laughlin uh, uh, considered, um, or the problem of uh, efficient coding of a single variable uh, using this uh, using uh, using mutual information. So So our model will be that we have a variable x. This is transformed into r. But r will be the sum of two things. It will be some function of x. This is um, what some, okay, this is some function, nonlinear function of x. This is what we had in the previous, in the initial formulation, but now we'll allow it to be corrupted by noise. And uh, we will assume that uh, Xi is 